Previously, we discussed the purpose of the center of gravity and what it is. Some of you may not yet be entirely comfortable with the what it is part yet. But don't worry, it'll be more, become more clear as we go through the identification methodology. So let's begin. JP50 doesn't say how to identify a center of gravity. In fact, it refers you to JP2-01.3, which is the Joint Intelligence Preparation in the Operational Environment, which basically says, use a systems perspective and do a nodal analysis to determine where the enemy derives his strength. The technique it recommends is to, quote, to visualize. That's it, visualize. So how do you visualize and analyze a system? Joint doctrine is silent on this subject, leaving it up to you. So I'll offer you a method to visualize and analyze a system to determine its center of gravity. It starts with the system's perspective, and you view the friendly and adversary entities as systems. But it uses the strategic framework of ends, ways, and means to answer three basic questions about the system. First, what is the end state or goal of the system? Second, how, what are the ways, that the end state can be achieved? Lastly, it asks, what are the means required to execute the way or how that achieves the end state. Now it's important for planners to devote sufficient study to these simple yet critical questions. Fortunately, operational design along with the intelligence estimate of the adversary will help answer these questions. The first step is to identify the end state or goal. Second, list the ways with an effort to identify the primary way that achieves the end state. It's also useful to think of the ways as a verb because this helps identify the critical capability. Then third, list the means required to execute and support the chosen way. This is generally a list of things. Think of them as nouns, although they may include some actions. The last step is to select from the list of means that item that inherently possesses the critical capability to execute the chosen way. That item is the center of gravity. All others are just requirements. Note that the key step in this process is identifying the critical capability, that is the way to achieve the goal. Identification of the critical capability must occur before identifying the center of gravity. Identifying the center of gravity is actually the last step, which is the reverse of doctrines, cog and critical factor analysis. Explained another way, ask what do I need to do to reach my objective? And what can do it? The doer of that action is the center of gravity. We then validate our selection by using the does or uses test that separates the center of gravity from requirements, and we'll discuss this test shortly. This is a way of showing the relationship between the center of gravity and its critical factors. The critical factors are critical capabilities. These are the primary actions, the think of verbs we abbreviated as CC. They are not nouns, they are actions, verbs that things can do. Next are critical requirements, abbreviated CR. These are things that a cog must have, hence the word critical in order to execute the capability. These are nouns and critical must haves. The last is CVs or critical vulnerabilities. These are sub elements of critical requirements that are vulnerable to enemy exploitation. They are directly connected to critical requirements. If you have a critical vulnerability that cannot be linked to a critical requirement, perhaps it is not critical, or it is just a simple vulnerability, or your list of critical requirements is incomplete. 
The center of gravity and critical factor should logically follow the same hierarchy as the ends, ways, and means relationship. Remember, you identify the goal, then the way to achieve that goal, which is your critical capability, and from the list of means available, determine what has the inherent ability to perform this critical capability. That is your center of gravity. The other means may be critical requirements, and some of which may be vulnerable. This construct reinforces a proper relationship and the importance of asking what action accomplishes the objective and what can perform that action. It also illustrates the relationship between the center of gravity and the objective. This construct differs some from some of the doctrinal and instructional material that suggests you identify the center of gravity first and then ask what can it do. I would argue that is an arbitrary and flawed method. So we have a pretty good method to identify the center of gravity that is backed by the logic of the ends, ways, and means method, but we now we need a validation test. And it is the does and uses test, also known as the supported and supporting test. Doctrine's method to validate the center of gravity is, quote, the defeat, destruction, neutralization, or substantial weakening of a valid cog should cause the adversary to change its course of action or prevent the adversary from achieving its strategic objectives." End quote. Again, that's from JP 50, page 3-24. The problem is this method relies on a wargaming process which doesn't occur until long after the cog has been selected and a course of action developed. And it doesn't really validate a center of gravity selection. It may, in fact, only suggest that you are exploiting a, exploiting a critical vulnerability or a critical requirement that neutralizes the actual but yet unidentified center of gravity. The does and uses method complements the ends, ways, and means center of gravity identification method, and it doesn't rely on wargaming of courses of action. This test is also useful when defending a selection of a center of gravity. The purpose of the does and use test is to verify the center of gravity selection and to identify critical requirements. This slide explains the criteria for the test, but let me offer you an example. Our system is a railroad. The end state is to produce a profit by transporting passengers and freight. The critical capability is to move freight and passengers from point A to point B. So to move is the critical capability. Now the means and resources required include the tracks, fuel, freight, passenger cars, operators and a support staff, and the locomotives. Now we ask from the list of means, what has the inherent capability to move the freight and passengers? Tracks. No. They do nothing by themselves other than support and guide the train. They are used by the train. Fuel? No. Fuel does not move anything. It is used and consumed by the locomotive. The cars, no, they hold freight and passengers, but they do not move them. Cars are by, used by the locomotive to move them. Operators and staff, no, they are critical, but they do not have the inherent capability to move the freight and passengers. The locomotive, yes. The locomotive is the doer. It has the inherent capability to move. But it cannot do so without the other means. The fuel, the operators, 
and therefore the other means are critical requirements that the center of gravity requires to function. Now some will argue the locomotive is nothing but a hunk of lifeless metal that does nothing without the humans. So humans are the center of gravity. But remember the system's goal, making money, transporting freight. The humans cannot achieve this because they lack the inherent capability to move the freight. But what they did have was a need for and the capability to create a center of gravity. Now this is under, important to understand. A system has a goal and must create or find a center of gravity to achieve that goal. Remember, the center of gravity is the doer that performs the capability that achieves the objective. Everything else are supporting or perhaps critical requirements. And now we'll discuss when to identify a center of gravity. There is very little discussion in doctrine on when you should identify the center of gravity. Although JP50 has figures that suggest it's during operational design's environmental phase, that is actually an editing error. We identify friendly and enemy cogs at different times, and the identification of the enemy center of gravity occurs first. Operational design's problem identification step is where we start the identification process. You should view the problem as a system, and that system is the adversary. So problem equals adversary system. We then use the center of gravity identification process to determine that systems, ends, ways, and means, and then from that we identify its center of gravity. So the problem identification step is when we identify the enemy center of gravity. You identify the friendly center of gravity during the operational approach step and no earlier. The logic is simple. Figure out a problem and its center of gravity before you determine a solution. The operational approach is the solution and its ways become the critical capabilities or CCs required to eliminate that problem and attain the goal. Once you've identified the critical capabilities needed in the operational approach, you determine what possesses those critical capabilities, and that is your friendly center of gravity. If the commander chooses a different approach using different capabilities, you would have a different center of gravity. So as a review, identify the enemy center of gravity during design's problem identification and the friendly center of gravity during operation or approach step. Now that you know what a center of gravity is and how to identify it, the next step is using it. When outlining a concept of operations, the center of gravity and its critical factors can provide a useful framework. The center of gravity and its critical factors suggest what to attack and to defend. For example, attacking or defending critical vulnerabilities can become objectives or missions for subordinates. Critical requirements and vulnerabilities can also be decisive points, and organizing them may suggest lines of operation or lines of efforts, and sequencing them suggests phasing. Now here's a graphic to illustrate this. Starting at number one, recall that the system has a goal that we'll call the ends. Number two, recognizes that the system has a menu of options for ways to achieve the ends. The ways chosen become critical capabilities. Number three says the system possesses or can obtain resources or means, and the, the means that executes the critical capability is the center of gravity. All other means, if relevant, become critical requirements. Number four says, if the center of gravity must have those requirements to execute the critical capability, they are critical requirements. 
If any of the critical requirements have vulnerabilities to disruption by an adversary, they are critical vulnerabilities, which is number five. And number six, planners use these factors in the identification of decisive points, tasks, objectives, or missions that are the framework of an operational approach or a concept for a campaign plan. At number seven, planners can group critical requirements and critical vulnerabilities, which are now decisive points or tasks as lines of effort, lines of operation. This is how a sound center of gravity identification and analysis focuses planning. And this is what makes the center of gravity the heart of operational art. And thank you very much. This concludes this video series.